Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, this is the third lecture in our public lecture series this year. So if you've been to the first two, you've already heard my little spiel. But if not, welcome. My name is Lily. I am an education specialist here at the Patent Center. And I'm going to go over a few safety rules um, before we start. And then I have the honor of introducing our speaker tonight. Um, so in case of an emergency, your closest exit are these four doors on the side here. They lead directly outside. So that is the fastest way out of the building in case of an emergency. If you need to use the restroom, they are directly that way. There's a door that leads to the restroom, um, but if you would prefer to sneak out the back, you can do that and then turn right. There's also water fountains over there. So if you need a quick sip of water, please feel free to step out. Other than that, I think we're ready to introduce our speaker. So this is Ray Mooney. Ray has been the city of Port Aransas nature preserve manager since 2019 and has lived in Port Aransas since 2007. Ray is currently working on projects to improve public access in the nature preserve and to increase connectivity between sites. Habitat management and invasive species removal are, are also high priorities for the nature preserve. Ray and Nature Preserve staff work with volunteers each week and provide weekly free programming in the Nature Preserve. And I know some of those volunteers are here tonight, so thanks for coming. In 2019, Port Aransas was certified as a bird city. Um, sorry, I lost my place. A bird city, Texas community by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in Audubon, Texas. Ray serves as the coordinator and has been working with partners to expand education and outreach on the various threats to bird, birds in cities. Previously, Ray worked as a project manager at the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program and as a research scientist here at the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve at the UT Marine Science Institute. She has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Towson University and a Master of Science in Marine Science from the University of Texas at Austin. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to Ray. <laughs> uh, thank you. OK, is that working? Yes. OK, well, that was a very long introduction. <laughs> thank you, Lily. Um, yeah, so I moved here in 2007 to, as a graduate student here. So um, and there's Joan, one of my old professors. Um, she provided some good uh, historical knowledge of what I'm going to talk about today as well. Um, I thought um, that I would talk a little bit about the history of all the birding sites in Port Aransas, um, which I learned some of this just this week, last week while I was working on this. Um, but uh, just to show how um, there's been so many people involved and uh, it's been uh, some, we had some good momentum in Port Aransas to get all these great um, sites out for people to come enjoy the wildlife. So, um, all right. Okay, so I know a lot of people here, so I know you've been to the nature preserve, but just so you know that um, what I'm talking about. So it's all of the nature and birding parks within the city of Port Aransas. So they're all, kind of now called the Port Aransas Nature Preserve. So it includes uh, Wetland Park, which is uh, the gazebo across from the post office, uh, Joan and Scott Holt Paradise Pond, the Leona Bell Turnbull Birding Center, and then this large uh, area where we have access on the north side and south side is the Nature Preserve at Charlie's Pasture. So, and there's other great places to go birding in Port Aransas uh, as well. Um, Roberts Point Park, the beach, uh, the jetties, and uh, the Wetlands Education Center here. So there's a lot of uh, good amenities in Port A, not just the nature preserve. Um, but so many of you may, uh, may, I'm sure know, I've seen a lot of you out at the nature preserve is Port Aransas is a birding hotspot. So we have that uh, advantage besides all the stuff that we've done, you know, birds are coming here for various reasons. Um, we have our most famous winter residents. Uh, this was from a few years ago. A family of uh, whooping cranes has been uh, a pair or family has been wintering here uh, since January of 2018 when Scott, I think, was the first person to see them. <laughs> so uh, that's been really exciting. Um, and then 
We have our uh, spring and fall migrants that come through the area that are really fun to go out and watch. And then uh, these pictures are mostly our, our year round residents. We have tons of birds here all the time. So plenty of uh, bird watching opportunities. Uh, big reason why we have uh, such a great uh, spring migration and fall migration is because where we're located geographically along the uh, what's called the central flyway. So there's tons of birds, hundreds of species that are uh, migrating from the Arctic areas uh, and most of them are going down to um, Central and South America. And so they come through here for um, a period of time. So when they're, especially when they're coming up to go back north for the summer to nest for the spring, um, they come, a lot of them come across the Gulf of Mexico or just along the, uh, the coastline, they might hit a north wind or a weather event. And then it's, the birders call it a fallout. Um, and it's just spectacular, like just tons of birds all over the trees. Basically they land and sometimes on the beach, even I've seen little tiny colorful birds just sitting there like, oh. Um, and you know, they're, they're tired. And if they hit a North wind that's resistant, uh, you know, a little resistance, they hang out and they feed. And, um, so they're really easy to watch too, because of that. So a lot of you, I know are here just for the winter, but I encourage you to come. I can remember the first time I saw this and it's just really cool. Uh, end of April is really the best time. So, and then in the fall, though, those birds come through as well, but it's not as, um, it doesn't seem to be as concentrated. Uh, whereas in the spring, it's, you know, you hit these periods of time and it, late April, early May, that is, uh, it's really spectacular. Um, and so this is a heat map we uh, produced from some of our visitor sign-ins. And so we're seeing now Port Aransas, um, we're getting birders from everywhere as well. Um, this is from just the nature preserve sites, people from all over the country. And um, we often have international visitors as well to visit for, um, for bird watching. So um, it's you know very good for tourism in Port Aransas. And so when I started thinking about kind of what I wanted to talk about, I thought maybe I would, um, like I said, I would learn a little more about the history myself talk to some people, read old South Jetty newspapers. You can really um, go down a rabbit hole <laughs> on the internet. Uh, you can read it like every South Jetty article and newspaper uh, on this one website, which is really cool. And, uh, and I spoke to Joan and some other people about um, what um, it was like when all this stuff was starting to be, get developed. And so this is a picture, uh, I never met Leona Bell. But this is Leona Bell Turnbull. So her, uh, they named the birding center after her. She led bird walks there for a very long time. And uh, she was very dedicated. And uh, so the first birding site in Port Aransas was the birding center. And Joan told me today that they kind of discovered it just by walking along the electrical lines and they found the pond that is there at the uh, birding center and saw that it was a really great spot to, uh, to check out birds. So, um, in uh, 1994, the construction was completed and the part of it was developed because of a mitigation project that they needed to do uh, when they were building the ferry loop in Roberts Point Park. And um, this was the, so they worked with the Water Development Board, the city, uh, I mean, the water, the Nueces County Water Control District, number four, and that they own the land where the birding center parking lot exists and uh, the, the effluent there at the um, wastewater treatment plant is emptying into the pond at the birding center. And uh, so they leased, the city started leasing the land to um, create the birding center. And um, this was really cool uh, because it was the first uh, birding amenity, you know, to make it a little easier for people to get out there. Not everybody was gonna hike you know, through the, the marsh and <laughs> along the power lines, I don't think, but probably opened up a lot of opportunities for people and then the alligators were there. So that's exciting for everybody. Um, but, um, and this was the first site on the um, Great Texas Coastal Birding Trail in Port Aransas. There's, I think five or six. 
So, but the day that the uh, birding center opened, I found this editorial by Mary Judson. She's still um, with the owner of the South Jetty where she says that um, this is the most exciting chapter of the um, Port Aransas is about to unfold. And it's the beginning, um, the opening of the birding center will be the Boulevard to Nature Tourism. That's the future of Port Aransas. So I just thought that was so cool um, because she saw that back then. And, um, you know, no, I don't know that, I don't think a lot of people were really thinking about that, but she goes on to talk about the type of um, tourists and how they're um, gonna care about the area they're in. And they're probably, you know, gonna be, um, they like to maybe just the fish, see the beach, you know, those types of tourists. And that's the type of tourists she wants to see in Port Aransas. So I thought that was pretty cool. She was kind of nail, hit the nail on the head. So when the mayor and everybody saw how the potential of the birding center, it sounds like they decided to buy this land off of 361 to uh, develop Wetland Park. Um, and again, with the development of the Great Texas Coastal Birding Trail, which is a TxDOT and a Parks and Wildlife uh, Partnership, um, they paid for the construction of the, the whole thing, but the city purchased the land. Um, and it sounds like whoever they bought it from, it was less than half the value. So it was a great deal. The city was like, this is awesome. You know, we don't have to put that much into this. Um, but the article I read in the paper said that people were often, you know, pulling over on the side of the road, which was farm to market 361, not Texas State Highway 361, as we have it now, um, pulling off from the side of the road and viewing birds in this area. Um, you can see anytime there's water there, there's just tons of birds. So, um, so they developed that. And then um, we moved the city and a bunch of folks in Port Aransas started working on Paradise Pond. So um, there's uh, Joan and Scott in the paper uh, shortly after it was opened. And um, Joan told me also that they would, you know, there's no development around Paradise Pond except the motel was there, which was the Paradise Isle Motel. And they would kind of hike in from or sneak in from different areas and get to the uh, pond because there's not that many freshwater ponds here in Port Aransas. So this was a really special place that had the black willow trees that all the birds love. And um, so they, uh, Joan's sister, Cecilia Riley wrote this proposal for the Great Texas Birding Classic. So that's a birding contest that we anybody can uh, participate in, but the winner gets to pick who gets awarded the grants. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the winner that year chose uh, the grant that they submitted uh, to purchase and develop Paradise Pond into a birding official birding spot because it was kind of it was private property, but <laughs> nobody seemed to care, I guess. <laughs> so as Joan and I were talking about, the motel uh, donated some of the land where the pond is. Does that turn off? No. Okay. Um, and. Recently, some of our volunteers over there were there. We've been um, removing all the trash that was dumped back there. Um, and so uh, I think they, you know, they couldn't use it for the hotel. So what better way to donate it and um, we'll just keep improving it. Uh, some of the other land was donated by the Christensen family to create the roadway. And then um, they were able to build the boardwalks and uh, Haley. Um, and uh, create an official site. So, and then in 2004, they renamed uh, Leona Bell Turnbull Birding Center and Joan and Scott Holt Paradise Pond uh, to honor their dedication to the birding community. Um, so then um, came the big one, the Nature Preserve at Charlie's Pasture. Uh, in 1998, the city was undergoing their master planning effort, you know, looking at 10 to 15 years ahead, what, what do we wanna do? Um, I was not here, obviously I was in high school, <laughs> um, but, uh, and they prioritized uh, preservation and development of Charlie's pasture. I read that in the South Jetty. Um, and an issue that they were having was uh, they're along the ship channel. So there was no hardening of that shoreline. It was just like a beach. All the uplands along the ship channel were from when they dug the ship channel. So it was uh, what's called spoil. All that material, you know, was piled there. 
but it was eroding away at a rate of 10 to 17 feet a year. And um, so the city and all the people that were involved in this, pro this planning effort, they said there was hundreds of people that were uh, involved, um, wanted to see something done with that area um, and um, along the ship channel. So if they put a bulkhead um, creating that area to fish and walk or whatever, and then protecting the land that was eroding away and then um, preserving Charlie's pasture as a nature preserve. Um, so they, they built the, the bulkhead to protect the land first so they could put the road in. And then, um, so most of the nature preserve of Charlie's pasture is owned by the Texas General Land Office. And we, the city leases it on a long-term uh, lease for uh, the purpose of having a nature preserve, providing public access and protecting it for wildlife. So that started in 2002, but then they needed to buy a bunch of land to get, um, to be able to get out there and build the road further. And uh, also the area by the pavilion is large, that area they had to buy all that. And then the 1,200 acres out in the wetlands was leased. So it was kind of a lot to buy all that land and get that started. But then by 2009, they opened the north side by the pavilion. Um, and then 2010 opened up the south trail. So it moved pretty quick for everything they needed to do. Um, there was a gazillion funding partners and uh, all that too. Uh, so it was a lot of uh, planning efforts. So this is a picture uh, from uh, 2009 of uh, right after the construction of, you know, it kind of looks like fresh construction uh, out there. So, okay, I don't want to talk about this that much because I don't like to talk about it, but um, as many of you know, uh, or may have been winter uh, Texans around that time or residents uh, we had a pretty bad hurricane in 2017. So Hurricane Harvey damaged all of our sites and com completely destroyed most of them. So, I mean, I'm only going to talk about the nature preserve, but, you know, obviously the city, you can drive around and see just our police station still under construction and stuff like that. So, um, but we had all this great stuff. It wasn't even open that long. And um, we got a big, pretty big setback. But... Um, so Colleen Simpson uh, is here. She's the director of parks. I know a lot of you know her. Uh, she was the nature preserve uh, manager uh, before me. And she had just been hired in 2016. She had all these great ideas. She's a great educator. Um, and uh, that happened. So she had to quickly moved into kind of rebuilding mode like everybody. And uh, But one of the things that we were, was in the long-term plan was to build a connection at the birding center to that South Trail. So this kind of catapulted that, this because the things that were destroyed by the hurricane were gonna be repaid by uh, FEMA, disaster assistance, but new things. So this new boardwalk that one, if you walk out there, if you've been and you go to the left, that was something that we wanted to do. And there was this opportunity with the Rebuild Texas Fund. So that was with Susan and Michael Dell, um, so they had created this fund for Harvey uh, impacted areas and Colleen got the grant for that. She got a recreation trails from Parks and Wildlife Department funding from the Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program and the city of Port Aransas and built that boardwalk. And it was amazing because by March um, of 2019, it was open, which is pretty quick after the hurricane. Um, and so we had that, like she talks about, I mean, I lived here and I was, I would go out there and stuff. I mean, it was just so awesome to have a spot again to go out there and um, and be be out at the birding center again. Um, it, everybody was, um, you know, really happy about that. And so by 2022, beginning of last winter, we rebuilt the birding center boardwalk, the direction it used to be, and then the South Trail. So that's what that picture is there. And there's the whooping cranes out in the distance and. Uh, so that was the ribbon cutting for that. So we had a lot of, um, took a while, but we've had a lot of good progress. Um, now we, we also, last year, we did our open space master plan for the uh, city of Port Aransas Parks and Rec. And one of the big things that we discovered people wanted and what we wanted was also, again, that uh, creating the connectivity with parks. So 
uh, that you could walk from one to another. Um, and so we, we were able um, last year, so this map is showing basically the trails in the nature preserve. So this red one, that's the Salt Island Trail that has still not yet been rebuilt. Probably will, won't be for till next summer, like 2025. But all the green are trails that you can walk out on and yellow as well. But the yellow ones are gonna be improved soon. So I'm gonna talk more about those in a little while. But um, one thing that um, we were able to do was connect Paradise Pond. So I'm gonna talk about that in a second. So that's connected now over to the community park. So you can take that walkway. Um, and the city is gonna be improving Ross Avenue uh, this year. Like I think they already have a contractor. So there's actually gonna be a sidewalk. So you can walk from the community park down to the birding center, which is gonna be great because the, the dump down there, um, excuse me, the, so the transfer station. <laughs> um, there's a lot of traffic. It is a scary road to walk on. So um, I think a sidewalk's gonna be amazing. Uh, so um, that will be really nice for everyone um, so that you can come walk the, down there to the birding center. And then uh, I'll talk about it again. We're gonna be resurfacing these trails. So, as I just mentioned, the Paradise Pond, um, I have no idea what time it was. Okay. So, well, I'll just a short history on Paradise Pond. Um, in 2015 and 16, um, this land back here was starting to get developed. So they were clearing that land. It kind of opened up things a little bit on the back of it. And then um, AEP came in and cleared their right away, which is for uh, reliability of service and safety. So, um, but it, it was pretty shocking to everybody. And uh, that's what's kind of spearheaded the city to finally hire a nature preserve manager is because they saw the outcry. Like it was very emotional for everyone. Um, but, and then a year or less later, the pond filled with salt water from Hurricane Harvey and that further killed the trees that um, did survive. So that's kind of what we're, we're dealing with there. Colleen had worked with uh, Scott and um, the fire department and the, um, the golf course to pump the salt water out of the pond after the hurricane and fill it with fresh water and pump it and fill it. And, um, and uh, so they were able to get that salt water out uh, and probably saved a lot of trees, but um, Anyway, we've been planting like crazy, so um, we are we are working on it. But the the uh, developers held these lots for us. So those are six residential lots that could have been homes, and they held them for us. And we bought them uh, about two years ago. Um, they they sold them to us for half of what, or less than half. It was appraised, and um, with a Parks and Wildlife grant, we bought that and city money and extended the boardwalk across and connected over to the community park. Um, so uh, we are gonna be, we planted some trees. Oh, I got pictures here, yeah. So uh, some of you might've been there. We planted some trees last December on the new lots and we're gonna be planting again uh, the Thursday before the Whooping Crane Festival, um, February 22nd. So anybody is welcome to come. Uh, here's the what the trail looks like uh, going over the community park. It's six feet wide, and then uh, the boardwalk um, extension. So um, I encourage you to check that out if you haven't yet. Uh, okay, so other things that we're working on. So when the birding center was uh, developed, uh, the water district didn't own this property next to us, but now they do. So they've added it to our lease. And so we're gonna be adding parking. So if you've been over there this winter, it's like crazy sometimes um, with the parking. So we're gonna go from 14 spaces to maybe around 66 parking spaces. So that'll be great again for the safety of, um, you know, when you're parking like way over here and you have to walk and all those trucks are coming through. Um, so, and then we're gonna be resurfacing the existing lot and kind of connecting it over to here. That's probably gonna happen this summer. We're working on it now. 
And then the final piece of the trail connection from the, this is the birding center boardwalk. There's a cement trail here, and then there's like a dirt trail. We're gonna be resurfacing this um, also this summer. So this connects over to the South trail that takes you down Charlie's um, over to 361. So that's uh, also being uh, in the design phase right now. So Clay's Hill Trail is that little trail that's across from the pavilion uh, on the north side of Charlie's Pasture. We're going to be resurfacing this. Right now it's kind of, it's just a mode trail. So we're going to be um, connecting it to the concrete paths that are here and um, going up the hill and adding some uh, little observation decks with shade. Um, and then we're adding additional uh, anti-vehicular fencing in some areas we don't have fencing around the nature preserve so that people know um, you're not supposed to go out here you're supposed to go on the trail so this is kind of way out in the future plans but um, the city does own this land uh, it's on the southern end of the city limits by the water tower and um, we're planning to uh, put in kayak access here. So I was planning to apply for a grant that they said would be announced in the fall, but I haven't seen it yet. But the boating access grant for Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, Parks and Wildlife is, already has their uh, paddling trail on Mustang Island. So we could add a site here in Port Aransas city limits uh, for that, that paddling access on the back side of the island. So we're, sort of in the planning phase. Um, we need to design it and permit it, which is gonna take a few years. So it'll be, this is, you know, several years out. Yeah, this is a Gulf Waters RV, uh, right across from the, uh, the entrance. Yeah, oh, well, we're here, yeah. So I think this is like Cinnamon Shore South, Gulf Waters, maybe. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of switch gears now. Uh, so Lily mentioned this uh, about uh, this Bird City Texas certification that we have. So the city of Port Aransas, we were uh, designated as a Bird City Texas community in 2020. We were one of the, there was four inaugural cities. So this is like a pretty new program. And um, this doesn't have to do with the amount of birds you have in a city, although we do good with that too, but it has to do with what you're doing to create safe spaces for birds. Uh, if you're you know, protecting habitats, um, doing community engagement, working on invasive plants, all that stuff. Um, so we created a group and basically I, uh, me and Colleen, we, we already kind of knew what all the people in the community were doing that reached all these criteria. And so we went out and kind of talked with all of them. So we have a pretty big community group. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to do this uh, program, basically what you're doing already or help us do this and do more, you know, all these things. Uh, uh, would you be a part of our group? Um, and so we, we committed to doing these 26 different actions and activities that help um, birds in our community. And these are just our partners. And so I just kind of wanted to go through a few of those because a lot there's some that are things that you guys can do also. So one thing that they were super impressed with the, uh, was our uh, invasive plant uh, removal efforts. So in 2000, 13 or so, the city applied for a grant. They started seeing that this Brazilian pepper tree, which is, looks like this, was uh, becoming an issue. Um, it's interesting because I saw, I've seen in like old newspapers, there was a, a garden club of the month featured a Brazilian pepper tree in 1986 or something like that. So they were here, but they didn't become a problem till like, I don't know, people think maybe 2008, nine, they started seeing more and more. And then, um, so I don't know, I don't know what happened, but um, they clearly became a problem because this is a map um, of all the green is Brazilian pepper tree. Uh, the colors indicate various heights. 
The problem with these trees is that they're going to take over the grassland prairie. And that's the pretty grass area. You drive on Mustang Island, the beautiful grass. That's what the island really should look like. And in the state of Texas, there's about 1% of the coastal prairie remaining. And we've lost all of that due to um, agriculture, development, and um, a lot of it from suppression of fire. So when, when uh, before we you know, built buildings and cities, um, we would have wildfires here every two to five years. And so that would keep the woody plants uh, at bay. And it would, you know, the grasses love fire. And all the, all the wildflowers that grow in the grass, it's incredibly diverse area. So um, like inland Texas, just a little bit, a lot of that should be grasslands too, but a lot of it turned into shrubland um, for those reasons as well. But um, here on the island, we didn't have a problem really with that many uh, of those other native shrubs, but um, the Brazilian pepper tree has become a problem. So the areas where they invade, they'll just be a monoculture of Brazilian pepper tree. There's no other diversity. Um, and a diversity of plants leads to a diversity of bugs, which leads to a diversity of birds and other animals. So um, it's really important. So this partnership was created. Uh, the city started that with the Forest Service and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And it's all these uh, agencies and we have um, citizens were working towards removal of Brazilian pepper trees. So we help each other out um, with work days um, and we help each other write grants to get money to do it and all that stuff. So it's been really a successful partnership. So what's the process to, to get rid of these? Uh, you have to use chemicals, herbicide, herbicide, unless it's small enough and you can pull the roots out. So, but you can do it, you have to do it responsibly, you know, just put it uh, on the plant, not spray it all over the place. So we do it, you know, there's a way to do it where it's not gonna um, have a lot of off-target damage. So is there a program in like five years to get them all out of here then or something? Or? Well, there's a lot of seeds. And then the, there don't always, the when you spray it with the herbicide, it doesn't always completely kill it. Sometimes it does, but then there's a lot of growth after from the seeds that are underneath the tree. So then it's a lot like, it's a lot like in the nature preserve, we might work on 50 acres and we get somebody in there to do that, but then we have to continue all the time to monitor and pull them up or retreat them. So it's, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> But um, we've come a long way from uh, where it was, uh, you know, when they kind of started the removal efforts. Um, so I already kind of talked about fire, but um, we do use prescribed fire in the nature preserve also to manage the habitat. And this is a picture from uh, like three days after a fire. It's really cool. To, um, so if, if you're ever around when we have a fire and you can walk through the trail after, you should, it's really cool. Uh, and so with all that, we've been doing a lot of native planting and habitat restoration. Many, all the volunteers here have helped with these. Um, we're, you know, planting trees in uh, the, the birding center, uh, paradise, this is a paradise pond and uh, creating those wooded areas that the migratory birds need in these specific locations. Uh, we're gonna be putting more educational signs that are gonna be coming up next year. So maybe next uh, winter, you guys will see some of those. Um, I'm doing on time, okay. Okay, so, um, so here's some, uh, kind of some of the things that uh, we can do just as regular people. Um, there's been a big effort to ed educate folks on uh, the impacts of light pollution to birds. I know a lot of people hear about, you know, you lose the night sky in a, with all the light pollution, but birds are migrating at night for the most part. So um, the lights can really uh, disorient them and then cause them to spin, fly in circles or get confused. And then they're wasting those valuable resources um, and their energy. So this is like the coolest thing uh, and it's such a striking image. So they're using radar 
to um, my, uh, forecast bird migration. And so this day, uh, April 23rd, I don't know, 2021, they uh, forecasted 152 million birds would be migrating across the United States. And um, you can see where the high, uh, the high density was, was here. So um, we probably had a good day of birding after something, but uh, so they're basically saying, you know, during these migration uh, times to um, turn the non-essential lights off. So of course there's always lights for safety um, from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. during those time periods. Um, and um, this is pretty cool way to show that. And so this is also kind of an important image too, because a lot of lights are meant for safety, but then they're like, they're shining up, but we're down here. So um, if you're walking, what really matters is only the light here. So it doesn't even make sense. We're just like wasting energy or something. So you can buy lights that are down shielded, ones that, you know, turn on with a timer or just a, a sensor, but, and then the warmer colors are better. But what's great is I just bought lights for my house and you can buy, uh, they say dark sky compliant. So you can get those at Home Depot. Um, so you can buy those for, for your home or where, whatever you're lighting. And um, also another thing a lot of people like to uh, light their palm trees, shine the light on them up into the sky. So maybe avoid that. Uh, and then um, you can close your blinds at night so that the birds don't go towards the light and fly into your window. Okay, so this might be the last. Um, so another thing that you may or may not be aware of, the um, cats are very bad for birds. So um, the American Bird Conservancy has a uh, campaign called Cats Indoors, and uh, they said it's better for cats, better for birds, better for people. And so I like that because I recently read a research paper that said that an um, indoor cat lives like 10 to 20 years, but an outdoor cat lives two to five. So there's these things called catios. So you can put your cat outside, but in an enclosure, and they're recommending that because maybe your cat can get outside, but really being outside is not the best thing for your cat because there's a lot of dangers out there also. You know, with my dog, I have him with me all the time when he's outside, but cats, they kind of do their own thing. So they're kind of putting themselves in a little bit of danger as well. Um, but yeah, they are non-native species. And um, so they're a big threat. There's a hundred million, over a hundred million cats in the United States, and they are killing approximately 2.4 billion birds every year, just in the United States. So um, th that's the, oop, oops. That's the largest um, threat to birds really at this point, you know, besides it's just habitat destruction is right below that. So just something to think about. Um, it's a controversial issue, but just something to think about. <laughs> um, okay, the other thing you can do is you can plant native plants in your backyard or your, if you have a little land, even better. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the native plants are gonna host a more diverse variety of bugs. Um, these are great uh, nectar plants for um, hummingbirds, butterflies. And so we're gonna be having uh, another native plant sale if you're here March 2nd. And so we've been doing that with Keep Port Aransas Beautiful and the Nature Preserve. Um, and it's also a plant swap. So if you're clearing out your flower beds and you have extra of something, you can bring it and trade it. But and then we'll have the plants for sale. Uh, and then uh, if you guys aren't aware, so we have a bunch of free programs in the Nature Preserve each uh, week. So I encourage you to register and come to those. Um, the nature walks uh, the first Saturday of the month are at the community park. We meet by the pickleball courts and we walk that trail and then um, the third Saturday is on the South Trail. So we meet uh, at the entrance by the Palladium Apartments. 
Burning on the Boardwalk is every Wednesday at nine with Ray and Leslie. Uh, that's real casual, so you can come late to that too, because um, they just walk out onto the boardwalk so you can catch them uh, quickly. Uh, yoga in the Nature Preserves every Tuesday at 1230. And uh, this winter till the end of February, we have the Clays Hill Boardwalks with Clay Taylor. So that I mentioned the Burning Classic grants. Clay won the Burning Classic and picked the project at the hill. And I don't know who named it Clay's Hill. Did, did Scott? <laughs> I was going to say, I think Scott did. But anyway, Clay's really excited. There's a sign and it has his name on it. So he's leading bird walks and he is like expert. He can hear anything and tell you what it is. And he works for Swarski, which is a really nice binocular. So you can borrow a pair from him. So it's a pretty cool opportunity. Um, and then, yeah, we work with the little kids at the elementary school too. Um, and then if you aren't aware, you can register and buy tickets already for the Whooping Crane Festival. That's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of good speakers and um, um, tours. Yeah, that's um, just a, here in a month. And then uh, every Thursday we have volunteer days. Well, our volunteers are amazing. They do so much uh, for us, very dedicated. There's a bunch of them here uh, tonight. Um, and a lot of them are um, of the locals are master naturalists. And we also just have uh, residents and we have a lot of winter Texans that have come year and year uh, to volunteer. So we have different activities. You just, you get an email and you decide if you wanna come or not, it's not, no, no pressure. We'll kind of describe what we're going to be doing. So some people uh, don't like certain things, so they don't come. So uh, you'll have to uh, email me. I don't know who said that, but and then it changes every week. So uh, you'll get one email a week. We're not going to um, spam you too much. So and then Thursday, February 22nd, we're going to be planting trees at uh, Paradise Pond. So um, that, that'll be fun. Uh, we have uh, our, the, the group that's working to remove the pepper trees is going to be there. People from the festival are registering, so it should be a good event. This was the uh, planting we did last uh, December. There's some faces that are here. <laughs> um, so, all right, I guess that's it. There's my email. If anybody wants to, any more information. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone around so that everyone can hear where your question is. I looked at the statistics about how much longer the indoor cats live than the outdoor cats. Mm -hmm. And that's only a problem when indoor cats get into heat and they wanna go outside. Mm. It's very hard to get them from going outside. So are you su suggesting what? Neutering them all before they- To what? Out. What What was the question? Well, I don't know if there's a way to cut down the, because they will kill birds when they're out there too, not just right. being heat. So- Yeah. So they're, su they're suggesting just to keep your cat indoors and not let them outside. So- I do, I know lots of people that do keep their, I, I, I've never owned a cat. I'm very allergic actually. So I, but, uh, so I don't know what that's like, but providing the information, but I do know a lot of people that do keep their cats indoors all the time. Uh, and a lot of it is because of the coyote situation here. Uh, and so they don't want their cats. I mean, that I, most people I know in Port Aransas, they're like, yeah, my outdoor cat was lasted about two to five years, you know? Um, cause they're vulnerable out there as well. So, um, but I don't have any personal experience with an in indoor cat. Maybe it's a nightmare. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just curious as to what herbicide you're using. So, um, you can use, uh, glyphosate which is roundup right or uh what we use is called triclopyr so there's a product you can buy at like ace hardware and it says brush killer or stump killer on it 
and that's uh, the, usually the triclopyr chemical. And I think that works a little bit better. Because plants develop resistances mm -hmm. to herbicide use. Okay. So uh, do you use a surfactant with it? Mm -hmm. Do you know yeah. what I mean by, okay. Yeah. Do you use that with it? Yes, yeah. Okay. Depending on, um, and then certain chemicals need to be mixed with an oil. Right, um, so yeah. that it adheres better to the leaf, yeah. to the green surface. So there we have a couple, dip, we have a little cheat sheet. So all the different chemicals. Um, so if anybody wants that information, you know, we can help uh, uh, give you what we've experienced is the best. Um, I usually tell people to buy that um, stump killer, um, yeah. cut the tree and put it right on, right immediately on the stump because it calluses over very quickly. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, as a grower, monocultures are always a bad idea mm -hmm. because not only will it impact your native populations of birds, bees, butterflies, mm -hmm. and other things, but diseases. Yeah. Uh, so um, it will impact, and then you won't have the diversity. Yep. So, yeah, the diversity is important for so many reasons. Have, has anybody done any work with uh, cover crops or anything to enrich the soil? We had thought about that uh, because what we, the issue we've been having with um, a lot of the pepper tree removal areas is a uh, invasive grass moves in. So we have talked about um, using cover crops as an, maybe an option, planting those right away. Uh, that way the soil can be, yeah, enriched. It gets, it's covered that maybe the invasive grass won't move in and uh, holding the soil there. So um, we just have not done it yet, but it's a good suggestion. I know where you can get good seed. Okay. Green cover. Okay. They are a business in uh, Nebraska and Kansas. Okay, green and cover. And you look at them online. Okay, thank you. So you're welcome. Any other questions? So um, before Harvey, uh, going back to Charlie's pasture, we used to be able to go down and park where the pavilion was, mm -hmm. and then you would walk along the trail way down, um, okay. probably about a mile and a half to get to, I believe it's the inlet where Island Moorings comes out. Yeah. And there was a great place to go shelling down there. But once um, Harvey hit and it broke through the bulkhead, you can't do that. Is there ever going to be an opening to go back to do that again? Yeah. Um, I thought about adding that in there, but it was just like a lot of information. Um, but so that will eventually be reopened, that trail that was along the rocks there. Right. Um, so we, we, so in Hurricane Harvey, broke the bulkhead through and we lost a lot of land over there. So the bulkhead's been repaired. Uh, they're finishing up that construction so the next- fenced off and- Yeah, so they're, they're still working on that, you know, but it'll be finished some point this year, I guess. But the, the next issue is the rock revetment. The, the rocks that were along the shoreline beyond that has uh, three breaches in that. So once that's done, then we'll be repairing the rock area. So I don't know if in the meantime, if that will be open, but the first great breach in the rocks right after the bulkhead, um, the water moves through there pretty good. So um, you'd have to wade through some water. Uh, so, but um, I'm not sure if when the bulkhead construction's done, if you'll be able to just walk out there if you want to, but well, probably not because we, we won't be able to get mowers out there to kind of mow the area, but I don't know, we'll see. But it, eventually the plan is to have that access back. Okay. It's just, we have a few more things to do, so. Cool, we just yeah. love to go down the Yeah, road. I know. Yeah, a lot of people went, walked that way and fished in the channel too. Could you show us on the map how you would go from Paradise Pond to Charlie's Pasture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
We're getting there. Okay, there we go. Uh, so here's the parking for Paradise Pond. So uh, you would basically, this is the um, Port Street subdivision or uh, Lighthouse Cove. So there's a sidewalk through there and then you go around Channel Vista, there's a sidewalk path and then you connect to the community park and you can get on the community park trail out to the pavilion there. So if you wanted also, if you parked at the uh, community park, walk along the right side of the trail and you'll see the, the walkway um, there um, behind those homes there at the end of Channel Vista. Does that make sense? It's like, where did you go? There you are. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, do you have another question? So you're saying that's right behind uh, that San Juan restaurant. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So the adjacent sidewalk. Uh, well, it's a it's a concrete path. Yeah. Uh, through through the well, there's a sidewalk through the neighborhood and then a path around to get over to the community park. Okay, so you have to go through the neighborhood yeah. residential area mm -hmm. to get there. Yeah, just the end of the um, Freeport Street or something it's called. Anyway, you'll when you walk across the boardwalk, you just keep going straight, and you can park at the community park or the you know behind San Juan's. Any other questions? Oh. Oh. When we visit Charlie's Pasture, do you want us to stay on the trails absolutely, or can we wander off? Uh, you, uh, by get city? The per, to get yeah. the bird picture you want. We um, would recommend that you stay on the trail. It is a city ordinance uh, that to stay on the trails. Uh, I know. It is a little confusing because Packery Flats and Mustang Island State Park, you can walk around in the wetlands out there. They don't keep you on your trail, but a uh, uh, city of Port Aransas ordinance is to stay on the trail and that's for your own protection and the protection of wildlife. <laughs> and uh, I know it's tempting because you want to get a good photo, but that's why we have all these amazing amenities. <laughs> All right, any last questions? All right, let's give a round of applause for Ray. Mm -hmm. We would love to see you back next week. We are going to have Dr. Jordan Casey presenting next week and she's going to be talking about marine food webs. Um, so she is a researcher and professor here at UTMSI and she's gonna be talking to us next week. So hope to see you then.